Let's figure out this economy. We read of a Dow up 25% from the lows of last fall, and those tidy, if not gigantic, bankers' bonuses are back. But at the same time, unemployment has skyrocketed. Federal figures show that one out of every six workers is unemployed or underemployed. That's the highest figure since the Great Depression. Elizabeth Warren is uniquely suited to make sense of all of this. She's the Harvard professor heading up the Congressional Oversight Panel overseeing how the bailout money is being spent. Senior correspondent Maria Inahosa sat down with Warren for her take on the economy. Welcome back to Now on PBS, Elizabeth. Thank you. So let's start big picture. About a year ago, we were on the brink of financial collapse. Where did you think we were going to be one year later, and where are we really? I think the answer is nobody goes to bed now and worries that when we wake up tomorrow morning uh, that, that markets will have disappeared. But the things that drove us here are still here, and most importantly, the rules, the regulatory rules of the road, what you can and can't do on Wall Street and financial institutions have not changed. So did we make any progress? But look, we made progress in the sense that we didn't implode. And there are a lot of people who say we would have. You know, we'll never know. We but can't. we thought that things were going to change. We thought we were on the brink of crisis. Things are changing, regulation, new laws. What happened then? Well, we did make one big change, and that is we now know that the government will race in to rescue large financial institutions. And this is really important because it has changed the whole economic market. The part that has changed is that now we see the government as either an explicit or an implicit guarantor of huge parts, big, of the big part of the financial institution system. And that means pricing is distorted, and it means we live in a world of moral hazard squared. When you say we live in a world of moral hazard right now, what do you mean? What it means is think about the business plan now for uh, a financial institution, a big bank, that has a government guarantee behind it. In effect, they can say to the investors, hey, come invest with me, and I'm going to take it all to Las Vegas, and I'm going to bet it on red 22. And if it comes in, we are rich. And if it doesn't come in, the taxpayers will pay you back. So this is capitalism for dummies, and the US taxpayer is the dummy? Well, this is capitalism in a world in which the government either explicitly or implicitly says we will throw as many taxpayers under the bus as we need to to keep these large financial institutions afloat. All right, so people are hearing that now the Dow is over 10,000, mm -hmm. that, um, for example, Goldman Sachs now has a bonus pool of $16 billion, and so there's a kind of rah-rah, things are looking good again. We're also at 10% unemployment. So what's happening here? Well, those are actually two pieces of the same puzzle. Things are looking good at the top because they have fabulous guarantees, because we have pumped literally hundreds of billions of dollars into these largest institutions. And if that's not enough, we guaranteed them, even after they left TARP, they have guarantees. And for those within TARP, Citibank right now is sitting on a $300 billion guarantee from the American taxpayer. Of course their stock is up. Why wouldn't their stock be up? Look at the message here. The problem is the rest of us, the real economy. What's happening with unemployment? What's happening with foreclosures? Whether or not we really have a plan and, frankly, whether or not our government is behind the rest of us, rather than seeing us as someone who'll pay the bill for those other guys, is are, are we working on government plans and, and, and government ideas to support the middle class, the working class, to support the real families in America? All right, we spent some time with a family. Um, this is an American soldier who had just come back from Iraq. And he was unable to find a job, so while he was waiting to get his disability, he started relying on his credit cards. 
Andrew Spurlock and wife Michelle are struggling to raise three children and pay off a credit card debt that is threatening to drag them under. The job Andrew and Michelle had counted on fell through, and then Andrew's military disability payments were delayed. They took cash advances to help with the mortgage and used the cards for gas, food, and diapers. And then Michelle got a surprise in the mail. The minimum monthly payment on one of her cards had jumped from $90 to $270. So I call to find out this is a mistake. It has to be a mistake. Yeah, it's almost three times higher than you expected. Right. The interest rate went from 7% to 30%. 30 percent, three zero. Three zero. And when I called, you know, during that phone conversation, isn't there something you can do? You know, we're already having trouble making the, the minimum payment of ninety dollars and now it's three times that much and I've never, in the eight years I've had this credit card, ever paid late. Is there anything you can do? No, there's nothing we can do. Since our story aired, things have only gotten worse for consumers with credit cards. Listen to Congressman Barney Frank last week. They have retained the right unilaterally and retroactively to raise the interest rate on what you already owe them. It is the single unfairest economic transaction I can think of that doesn't involve a pistol. Over the last several months, many, many Americans have seen this happening, where their credit card rates are, are doubling, tripling, going as high as, as 30 percent. So why? Why? Because they can increase profits this way, and there's no one to stop them. They are raking in literally more than $100 billion a year from ordinary, hardworking, middle-class families on just credit cards alone. And they're lobbying Washington really hard to try to keep that in place. Well, but, but didn't the Obama administration sign legislation in May that basically said, this is not going to be, you're not going to be able to play like this anymore. So, But the laws don't go into effect until February. And so, frankly, the card companies are getting in as many punches as they can, as quickly as they can, because the law won't have any retroactive application. That's why some in Congress are now trying to move up the start date for the credit card reforms, claiming companies are taking advantage of the waiting period to hike up rates ahead of the new rules. There are fees for people who pay on time. There are fees for people who don't carry balances. There are fees for being inactive with your credit card. Because the whole point is to, is to customize the product around every single family to figure out how to wring every last dollar out of them. That's the business model. So this is happening from credit cards that are tied to banks that the American taxpayer bailed out, like Bank of America. We now own 34 percent of, of, of city, and they're raising their rates and doing these shenanigans. Yes, ma'am. And when these banks, for example, when they say, "Look, um, you know what? We have to raise our rates because it's a risky time out there, and there are a lot of people who are defaulting, and we have to protect ourselves," you say, "I say, they have figured out an improvement on their profit model." Why are you so anti-credit card? I'm not anti-credit card. Check my wallet. I've got two. I love having a credit card. I think it's terrific. I am anti-tricks and traps. I want to see Americans carry credit cards, but I want to see credit card agreements that are a page and a half long. I want to see... In big letters. In big letters, and the key terms are right there in front of me so that I can compare one to another to another. I can figure out which one's cheaper. I can figure out what the risks are associated with it. And then I know that the market works for me. All right, let's move on to the issue of foreclosures. Um, we have spent a lot of time going and reporting about foreclosures across the country. And, and one of the things that's shocking is when you see a map and you kind of see these dots representing foreclosed homes all across the country. Let's take a look. 